Hi, in this short talk, we're going to talk about chapter one from the book. Basically, how do we represent real world, real world phenomena in the digital environment? It's pretty difficult, and we have a couple of different data models that'll go through and do that for us. It's pretty interesting the way that geography and GIS is stored in a database. And in this, this lecture, we're going to talk about what it means to, how do we store these data? Here we go here. So when we talked about GIS, uh, different defini definitions of GIS have evolved in different areas. But the one unifying theme is that it's formed with a database, a spreadsheet, map information that we can visualize on a map and measure using real world coordinates like feet, miles, or whatever, not with scale based like inches or millimeters, and a computer link between the two of them. The difficulty is how do we stick all that's going on in the real world into digital format as numbers, whether it's our patients for a doctor's office, whether it's our students that we're looking at for after school program, the people that we're going to visit as a social worker. How do we stick those into a computer? So it requires that both data and maps be represented as numbers. Now, the number part of the map is pretty easy. We've got latitude and longitude. But the actual data part, that can be a little bit tricky. And I know in your quantitative analysis courses, we go through and do that. When we talk about spatial data model, we need to identify the spatial features from the real world that are of interest, whether it's a river, or a county, or a census tract, or a patient, or someone who died of cancer, or whatever. We've got to figure out what we want to model or map. And then we need to represent them using the appropriate data model. And we have a vector model, and we have a raster model. And these are two very disparate themes that we'll talk about. In this class, we mainly focus on the vector data model. But you can see here we have the real world. And basically, GIS is an abstraction of the real world. Using the vector data model, we represent things using points, lines, and polygons. You probably remember those from your um, Euclidean geometry classes that you took in high school. Or we could represent those as cells or pixels in the, what we call the raster data environment. Raster data models, I'll talk about really quickly, are basically thousands of tiny pixels that are used to represent continuous data, things that happen everywhere. Something like temperature, or elevation, or air pressure or precipitation. It happens everywhere. I go from one place to the other. Hopefully, I'm still going to have temperature there and air pressure there. And you can see how it models here. The darker, the higher, the lighter, the lower. You can see this is a river valley here. Now, this is where I grew up, up in New Jersey. This is a little river here that runs through here. And obviously, river is going to be the lowest elevation. As I go over here, you can see it's just broken down into little pixels. And that's what we call resolution. When you buy that new digital camera, and it has better resolution, basically, the smaller the smaller the pixels, that means the picture looks better and better. Um, we have the raster data model. I won't talk too much about this here, but one grid square is call, called the pixel. And this is what the satellite images we talked about before from remotely sensed imagery. This is the Pentagon here. If I zoom in enough, you can just see what each cell looks like here. Okay. And resolution means how far of a distance do we have here? Is it three feet? Each of these cells represent three feet or one feet. We have really good stuff that gets down to about one foot pixel resolution that's commercially available. Okay. We see raster data every day. But basically, this is just a raster image that I took. And I zoomed in. And there's little pixels there. But these aren't assigned data coordinates here. This one back here, This we can assign this latitude longitude and compare it with other remotely sensed imagery or GIS data. Some of the drawbacks are that, well, if I have points, lines, and polygons here, well, when I put them into a raster data environment, it gets well, a little bit choppy here. I'd rather have this than this. Okay, So there's drawbacks to working with draw raster data. And there's also some good things. Okay, You notice here, these are soil units. So this is more, this is what we call discrete data as opposed to continuous data. Okay. And as we zoom in, as we, as we decrease the cell size, it improves accuracy, but it will increase our file size. So if we go from 10 by 10 meters to 1 by 1 meter, well, if we increase the number of pixels that we need by 100, that's going to increase our, increase our processing time and the file sizes that we'll need. As you guys notice here, as you buy that new digital camera, 
they take up more and more space because you have more of these pixels that you need to store information about. Okay, in GIS, we store the actual attribute and the latitude and longitude location here with this mat uh, with uh, this matrix or lattice of cells here. In your digital image, you're storing the actual color. Um, these talk about some of the problems with raster data. I'm not going to belabor it too much because I really want to get into the vector data model. We have vectors. We have points, lines, and polygons. Okay, and you can see here this is an area of Southeast Virginia, Northeast North Carolina. We've got points here for cities. We've got lines here for highways, and we've got polygons. And you notice the polygons are a little bit different than your dodecagons and your nonagons and your octagons that you studied in Euclidean geometry. You can see each of the vertices here. This is a, an allotagon. Okay, how many vertices is it going to take to store the outline of Virginia or North Carolina? Hundreds. Okay, so you can see some of the problems that we have. And some of the files that we have are called shape files, coverages, or personal geodatabases. And now we've migrated to something called the file geodatabase. How we model the world, discrete points that have no dimensions, okay, literally just points, latitude, longitude. We might have airports, wells, cities, a crime location. As a social worker, it might be a, a church or a school or one of the patients that you have or one of your cases that you have. Lines, we have roads or streams. These are linear features. And we have polygons, things like buildings, which are a little bit bigger than points, lakes, cities, census block groups, counties. Okay? And typically, polygons are going to have area. We'll get the area inside of this. And then perimeter, the distance around it. Points have neither. Okay, they're just represented as a latitude and a longitude. So you can see here, out in western North Carolina, I've got lines here, these interstate highways that are being represented as lines. You can see, I think these are Native American reservations that are represented as polygons. And you can see the county outlines here. They might be represented as lines. They might be represented as polygons. Typically, we represent counties as polygons, and we just make them clear or blank, so we can kind of stick them on the bottom of everything here. The things about vector data is that they have the same general, same geometry type and the same general theme. Because you can see here, I've got federal lands and urban areas. Those are both polygons, and states are both polygons. But the attributes that I'm going to use to describe urban areas, like Richmond here, it's going to have a population and a name, is going to be different than federal lands. Federal lands have a population, they have a name and maybe an administrative agency, and we're going to have different attributes to represent those. Okay, likewise with airports, these are points. If I had other point features on here, such as parks, you would notice, well, airports and parks, we're going to store those differently. Again, I've seen some problems in the data management side of that. When we put the G in GIS, essentially, when I click on Richmond here, it gives me a location, okay, latitude, well, this is my longitude and my latitude, and we'll talk about those when we get into coordinate systems. And this is the attribute information about it. Okay? And this is using something called the Identify button. The Identify button gives me the attribute information about a feature that I click on. Okay? And you can see here, I've highlighted West Virginia here. And then when I look at the attribute table for it here, you can see it's highlighted within the attribute table. It's in blue. Okay, so you can start to see that the powerful link between the attribute information, which you're doing in your quantitative analysis, with the spatial information. Uh, vector data can be categorized, organized, however we want. Equal intervals or quantiles. We'll get into those with maps. And you can see here, this is what an attribute table looks like. We've got fields that read down. Some of these are going to be nominal data. Some of these are going to be ratio or interval data or categorical data. And then the and the features that read across are called records. So typically in a GIS, we're going to have a one-to-one -one relationship between the number of records and the number of features that we see on a map. This is the spatial data structures that we have here. We're not going to really cover this in class, but I just really want you to get a better appreciation for all the things that go on in the background so we can display spatial information. We have points, lines, and polygons. So this is all the nasty stuff going on in the background so that we can store things. Now, this is just using Euclidean. But we, we saw before, we have things in latitude and longitude, which is real-world coordinates. So it gets really ugly really quickly using a lot of precision, i.e. decimal points. Okay, And you can start to see, this is how we store a polygon. Okay. In summary here, when we have the vector data model, 
it has a lot more accuracy, less data volume, it's well suited for plotting, but the disadvantage of vector data, how do we represent continuous fields, how do we represent te temperature in a vector data? Okay, we can have isohyets, which are lines of the same temperature, isobars, or polygons. Okay, so we, when we develop these, we really need to figure out what data model we want to use. In this, we're going to talk about scale and units really quickly. We need to choose the right scale. As you notice right here, we have a couple of different GIS data layers that were created. This is the Chesapeake data, uh, Chesapeake Bay area here, and you can see this is a this blue one here represents it at a national scale. Not a lot of what we call accuracy, or this kind of looks a little bit choppy, but if I looked at this for the entire United States, it didn't look too bad. But when I zoom in, you can see how poorly it looks, how this blue looks. Okay, here, you can see all the outlines of the county. So we have different detailed layers. And you notice here, these are the same data feature, but one's called the detail layer, other ones call it a general layer. Because as you can imagine, as we need to st store all of these vertices and all of these points and lines and polygons, it's going to get really ugly really quickly, the amount of space that we have. So we need to determine the right scale. Typically, scale is the relation just between real-world distance and map distance. It's unitless. So a 1 to 25,000 scale means that 1 inch on the map represents 25,000 inches in real life. So if you want to make a map that has a real world width of 10 miles, the minimum width would be 27 inches okay, at a 1 to 25,000 scale. Okay, just doing the math there. Okay, so typically when we make a map, there needs to be a reconciliation between the scale that we want to display it at. As we zoom in more and more and more, 1 to 25,000 to 1 to 10,000 to 1 to 5,000, we can see features a lot more clearly, but that means we're going to need more space for the same area. When I worked with the military, we made maps at 1 to 50,000 for areas the size of New Jersey. They are 10 feet across. Okay, when we compute the scale, this is just simple quantitative, you know, this is a simple kind of expression that we have here to get rid of the units. So we know that 25,000 inches equals 1 inch in the map, 1 mile equals 63,000 inches, 63,360 inches. I'm a geek, I know that. And I can just cross them out so I can figure out 25,000 divided by 63,360 is going to be 0.37. And typically we have map scales at 1 to 62,500 that we make for the uh, states like Alaska. And basically those maps mean that 1 inch equals 1 mile. That's a pretty neat scale to look at. Uh, map units, when we, although we work with geographic data, we work with other units. So we work with degrees. Degrees are problematic because we have latitude, uh, latitude, longitude, or angular units. But we work with meters. Okay, and you can see down here, I'm working with feet here in different units here. Okay, I'm working with feet. Okay, I also have something called metadata that tells me when I created it. You guys, when you write a research paper, what do you have to put at the end? You have to put sources. Where'd you get the data? How, where'd you get the information? How good is it? Are you doing social work research or sociology research based on 1972 sources? Hope not. Okay, you're using the most latest and greatest stuff here. So metadata and GIS data tells us where we got the data, how recent it is, and how current it is. And then we also have accuracy. How far is something from geographic reality? Okay, that X on the map there, is it really there? And this gets into issues of accuracy. We have something called temporal accuracy, which means how recently was it created? We have attribute accuracy. Does that thing say, that attribute says it's Richmond. Is it really Richmond or Ohio Ridge Road? Okay, and there's ways that we can check on this. And then we also have something called precision. To me, precision means how many decimal points we store it to. If I'm representing the number of people divided by the number of families, average family size, that's going to be a number. Okay, if I just have it as an integer, like 1, 2, 3, 4, I don't have a lot of precision. I might want to store it to 2 or 3 or 4 decimal points. Okay. I also have a new technology called the GeoDatabase that we're going to be working with. We can create these in Art Catalog. In our classes, we're not going to concern too much with those, but Art Catalog is the way that we can manage GIS data. And there's lots of different sources out there. Typically, for our classes, I'll give you the data, and you work with it. And that's about it for chapter number one.